Welcome back to another episode of Create a New Tomorrow. I'm your host, Ari Gronich, and I have with me Paul Smith. Paul is a uh, former Procter & Gamble uh, uh, employee with consumer uh, communications and research. Uh, He's one of Inc. Magazine's top 100 leadership speakers in 2018. His work has been featured in the Wall Street Journal, Fast Company, Time, Forbes, and Success Magazine, among others. He's a, an MBA from the Wharton School, University of Pennsylvania, a best-selling author, uh, and he leads with a story. And I'm going to let him kind of get into what it is that he's going to be doing and talking about, because he's an incredible storyteller, and he talks about leadership with that. So, Paul, why don't you kind of give an, uh, an update, a background on why you became who you are and and what you have to offer people that is absolutely needed in, in the world at the moment. Uh, yeah, I think, Ari, what you just covered was my, my background up until about 2012. Uh, so at that point, I was 20 some odd years into my professional corporate career. Um, and along that path, I just got fascinated with this concept of storytelling. And, um, and that kind of frustrated me because, you know, they, they didn't teach me about storytelling at, at the Wharton School. They didn't teach me that when I joined uh, uh, Accenture. They didn't teach me that when I joined the Procter & Gamble company. Um, it, but yet I was, I was beginning to recognize how important of a skill set that was to be successful in the profession that I was in uh, or in business in general. And so I started interviewing leaders whom I admired and thought were particularly good at it first inside the company and then outside the company. And I mean, at this point, I'm up to around 300 or so, like individual one-on-one, face-to-face, two-hour-long interviews I've conducted with these CEOs and executives from all over the world, like 25 countries around the world. Um, and pretty quickly in that journey, I realized that, you know, if I want to know this that badly, probably other people do as well. And so it stopped being my own little selfish learning journey and became an idea for a book. Um, and so that, that's what led to my first book, Lead with a Story, which came out in, in 2012. Um, and then that led to another and another and another. And I, my, my fifth book just came out a few months ago. And so what I ended up doing was pretty quickly leaving my corporate career and becoming a full-time author and speaker and trainer on the subject of storytelling for leaders or for salespeople. I've got uh, one of my books is on, you know, uh, sell with a story for salespeople. One, there's one for parents, you know, uh, a couple of them are for, for leaders. So do you think that storytelling has become a, uh, a dying art as far as practice, or do you believe that it's going to have a resurgence? Because I know that for me, at least, my cultural history is all about storytelling. You know, if, if you look back, it's like, you know what happened back then because that person who was there told their grandfather, or, you know, told their kid who told their kid who told their kid who told their kid. And, and that's how, um, at least in my culture, we, we learn. And so, but a lot of cultures, it's not that way so much as dictatorial, here's what you do, but there's no context of the story behind it. So how does, how does that play out in, in modern world? And why is it that it's such a fascinating thing? We all love to hear people's stories. Yeah, so I think personally, you know, in people's lives, I think storytelling's always been... Um, you know, an important part of human socialization and family and, and things like that. In the working world, what, my, um, what I've learned through my research in this is that I think storytelling was actually important even in the business world, you know, or the, uh, the world of commerce for centuries. Um, but then I think there was a period of time in the early 1900s where it fell out of favor. You know, that's when you started to have professional business schools, you know, you know Harvard and Wharton and you know, et cetera, training people to become professional business people, which before that really wasn't a thing, right? If you, a professional was a, a lawyer or a doctor or something, but a business, anybody could be a business person, right? Just go start a company. Well, in the early 1900s, we started to credentialize and professionalize business. And if you wanted to be viewed as part of the avant-garde part of new business, you, you, you probably didn't do a lot of storytelling. 
because that seemed old school, right? You know, a a new business leader would lead with a bunch of spreadsheets and, and like you said, dictatorial, you know, methods of leading and, and, you know, having a very clear vision and using a bunch of uh, management techniques and things like that. And storytelling wasn't one of them. And so I think it fell out. I think you asked if if storytelling, you know, falling out of favor. I know, I think it did fall out of favor a hundred years ago. And about 20 or so years ago, I think it started to make its resurgence. Okay. Sounds good to me. Cause I, I, again, I, I really like having stories be part of, of at least for, for me, my business itself, you know, why everybody always asks, why did you become this performance therapist? And I have to tell them, you know, I, I started out as an athlete. I was five years old. I was playing, you know, th- well, three years old doing gymnastics, five years old, martial arts, playing baseball, doing all these things. And I kept getting injured. And so therefore, I had to figure out how to heal myself. And, you know, that story is kind of the, the re- repetition that I play out when, when somebody asks, um, I know a friend of mine is doing these things called, uh, the story of your business. And, there are books about why you started your business and they're like coffee table books and things. And, and that's starting slowly to, to build. So how do we build that momentum so that it becomes second nature again for people to be storytellers? And do we need our population to actually connect together again? Because, you know, block parties, same thing. You know, people are so separated that it doesn't occur to them maybe. So is, is that a, a possibility to, to rebuild that culture? And do you think that the storytelling will bring us together versus separating us apart? Yeah, so there, there are a few things in there to unpack. First of all, uh, about that coffee table book about the story of your, your business. Um, that typically, I would call that uh, the main story there is the founding story. Um, and, and I think that's a very important story for businesses, for people, for leaders to be able to tell about the company they work in. Um, in fact, I think it's the first story you need to be able to tell. Um, uh, but it's not the only one. And in fact, when people say the story of our business, um, they often make the mistake of assuming, well, we just have one story. Like, you know, uh, in fact, companies will hire me to, hey, uh, we need you to come and help us tell our story better. And the first question I ask them when I get on the phone with them just to plan the event is, when you say our story, what, what do you mean? And then they say all these things. Oh, well, you know, we've got this really unique process of, in, of innovation. And, you know, the way, our, the way the company started was really unique. And uh, our strategy is, is, uh, is really interesting. And uh, the first product that we've ever made. So, yeah, we want you to help us tell that story you realize you just rattled off like five different stories. I mean, you, you don't have one story. I mean, that would be a novel, right? If you were to write your one story and nobody in a business conversation has time to listen to a three hour story. They don't have time to listen to a 30 minute story. You know, you need, these are three or four minute stories that you would tell. So is this something that, that you would recommend like nowadays, everything is online. So should this be something that, that we do online as like a video as well as, you know, a written version of it so that people can really feel the energy of the person when they're telling that story or, um, I know as a- Yeah, I think video is a, yeah, video is a fabulous medium to tell stories, right? Because it's so much richer than just the written word on a piece of paper or on a blog post or something like that. So yeah, I definitely encourage people. In fact, several of my clients, um, you know, after we go create a story with them, they'll go hire somebody to help produce a video. In fact, I'm, I'm now starting to partner with somebody. I've got a call with them right after this um, with a production studio in California to do exactly that, to take stories from idea to concept to story scripting, and then all the way to having it, you know, produced into a final video. I think that's a, f- a fabulous way. And, and it's easier to tell it then because you don't have to be there face to face every time. They can just, they can go watch the video. Right. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. I have a, I have a friend's company that does the videos and another friend who does books, which is, is really interesting. One's in Miami and one's a, a nomad at this point, traveling nomad. Uh, in those stories, there are certain elements 
that people would probably want to highlight and uh, accentuate, you know? So what are the kind of elements that somebody who's watching the video would want to hear or see or feel based on what's going on in, in that story? So what are like the, the basic elements? Yes, yeah, so, well, the first and most important thing for the person telling the story to understand is what, what's the lesson that you want the audience to learn? You know, like, in fact, what do you want them to think, feel, or do are the three things I coach people? Like you, you, need, to, you need to have an objective in your mind. You, you shouldn't just be telling people stories to entertain them, right? Um, you're telling them for a reason. You're trying to accomplish something. You're either trying to get somebody to think, feel, or do something different than they are today. Um, so start, you start with that. And then once you have that end in mind, then you go pick the story to tell that will accomplish that objective, right? So then you got to go find something that actually happened in the world, in your experience, in your business, in your personal life or whatever, that will motivate somebody to do that, to either think, feel, or do something differently. And then you craft that into a story. And so, uh, but, but you start with the end in mind, right? What do I want people to think, feel, or do differently? Go find a story that will convince them of that. Then you craft the story. And there are little things that you'll want to do to make the story effective, like have the right structure to the story. These are just, like I said, three or four minute stories. So, you know, you, you need to have a tight structure. And I, I teach a very specific structure, the eight questions your story needs to answer. And in this particular order for the story to make the most sense. And there are specific techniques that you can use to create the right emotional engagement in a story. Okay. Reciprocal conversation. Awesome. Is there anything else that you'd like to, to share with the audience? Something that, uh, you know, tips, tricks. I mean, you've, you've been dropping a lot of uh, actionable steps already, but I always ask, is there two or three or actionable steps that somebody can take to learn, to learn this skill? skill? Mm -hmm. Because now we, now we know kind of some of the formats, but mm -hmm. the concept is not, mm -hmm implementation. So what are some things that people yeah. do to implement this skill set? Yes, yeah, so I'll, I'll, I'll give you one more. Um, is how to create a surprise ending. Uh, and you can do it with almost any story. And it's important that you do, by the way, um, not just because it makes the story more interesting or entertaining. It, it does that. Um, but in, in business stories or parenting stories, um, your goal is to affect change, right? You're trying to get people to do something different. And uh, it's important for them to remember the story that you tell them because the lesson is embedded in the story. A surprise ending literally, physiologically, makes the story more memorable because when somebody is surprised, there's a little bit of adrenaline that's released in their system. And studies show that uh, when you've got more adrenaline in your system, your memory process works better or more efficiently. So you literally, your memory is improved while that adrenaline is still kind of coursing through your, your system. So, and a surprise triggers that. So there's a practical reason to put a surprise into a, a story like this. Um, and you can put, you can, you can make a surprise ending out of almost any story. And I'll just, I'll illustrate it for you right now. So there's a young boy named James, nine-year-old kid. He's in the kitchen with his mom and his mom's sister. So while mom and auntie are sitting at the kitchen table, having a cup of tea, James is standing at the stove watching the tea kettle boil. And he's just fascinated with it, right? He's watching the jet of steam come out of the top of the tea kettle and he's got a, got a spoon and he holds it up there into the jet of steam and watches little drops of water condense on the spoon and trickle down and drips into a cup. He's got a little cup sitting there to catch the water. And he's just watching the cycle go over and over and over again. Just fascinated with it. Well, eventually his mother gets, I guess, tired of him in the kitchen and she just barks at him. She's like, James, like go do your homework, read a book, ride your bike. Like, Aren't you embarrassed just wasting your time staring at the tea kettle boiling? Well, fortunately, young James was undaunted by his mother's admonition because 20 years later, at the age of 29, of course, and in the year 1765, James Watt reinvented the steam engine, ushering in the Industrial Revolution that we, of course, all benefit from today, and all based on that fascination with steam that he developed at the age of nine in his mother's kitchen. All right. Now, the first time I read that story, um, was in a, a book titled James Watt, 
right? It was a, a story, a biography of the inventor of the steam engine, right? So of course it was no surprise to me at all that the story in chapter one about nine-year-old James was a story about the inventor of the steam engine, of course, right? Every, the whole book was about him. But to you and the people listening, unless you happen to be a history buff, that was probably a surprise at the end when you realized, oh, that was James Watt, the inventor of the steam engine, right? And why was it a surprise? Simple, because I didn't tell you his last name until the end of the story, right? Presto, surprise ending. So the technique is you take something that belongs at the beginning of the story, the main character's name, right? It's, it's, it's a question number three out of the eight questions is who's the main character? Most human beings expect to know who the main character is early in the story. It's, it's natural. So you're breaking that natural expectation. Take something from the beginning of the story and move it to the end of the story. Presto, you've created a surprise ending. You can do it with almost any story. Nice. Thank you so much for all of that. And uh, I really enjoyed this interview. How can people get a hold of you if they want to uh, work with you? Yeah, thanks. Probably my website's the easiest, which is leadwithastory.com. It's just the name of my first book. I guess I wasn't more creative with naming websites after that. But uh, yeah, leadwithastory.com. It's got links there to all my books and training courses and my contact information and all that. Awesome. Thank you so much. And uh, really appreciate you being here. There's been some great actionable steps. Uh, remember to like, subscribe, and review, rate and review, uh, this podcast. We want to be able to get it out to you and give you all kinds of tips and tricks on how you can make your business and your life a success and how you can create a new tomorrow today. I'm your host, Ari Gronich, and we will see you on the flip side next time. Thank you so much.